Thank you, Roland, for that second invitation. Um, thank you as well for the organizers for having me here tonight. And, and thank you for your time coming out on a night like tonight. Um, so I guess, you know, it's kind of interesting tonight in the first half of the, to the first talks uh, before the break, uh, there was discussion about orphan products. So <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit during my talk about, you know, this growth sector within the life science, pharma, biotech space that is uh, orphan drug products. <clears throat> and just so that everyone is clear, uh, what are orphan products? It's very simply a designation that's given to, to drugs that are used to treat rare disease. You heard the uh, definition of rare disease. It affects one in 2,000 people. Some people use five in a 10,000 or 50 in 100,000. It's the same uh, metric no matter which one you use. <clears throat> but the rare diseases, they're very, people think it's a small market. And some of the diseases are small, very rare. <clears throat> they're called rare, rare. Um, but Fundamentally, globally, 300 million people suffer from rare diseases, 30 million people in Europe. So it is a huge market uh, and one that Open Orphan is uh, focusing on. Um, <clears throat> this is my first talk in Manchester, my second, uh, we had one in London. Uh, the CEO of Open Orphan is actually at a London event. So we are talking to the market, talking to investors. We want to tell you the story. Um, and this is our first story to you, to you, to this team, because um, we only be, we went public about three months ago. So this is a kind of a quarterly update since we went public, and I'll tell you about that in the next few slides. So the usual disclaimer: obviously, there's risk associated with any investment, but a little introduction to Open Orphan. So we we went public on AIM. We're also on the Dublin, Euronext, Amsterdam, Paris, German market uh, as Orf. Market cap about 17 million. Share price today 6.2, um, and that's a big increase from our, our 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 reverse takeover when we acquired Venn Life Sciences, which we're trading at. Uh, 1.8p. So it's over a triple increase since the takeover. Uh, we IPO'd as a, it says, shows there end of June. Then Life Sciences was uh, the co company we acquired or they acquired us. Uh, and we raised 4.5 million fresh money from in institutional investors in London principally uh, during that time. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the, ex the management team, uh, very experienced and appropriate to this sector. Um, we own about 35% of the company, 40% uh, institutional investors and the rest hopefully for you guys. Um, we have, uh, in last year, the company we acquired, Venn Life Science, had 14.5 million in, in sales uh, up to 2018. Um, really what we're doing to Venn, and we acquired it, and I'll tell you a little bit in the next few slides, at a very good price. We are also consolidating Venn to right size. We're also acquiring other companies to have a pan-European uh, activity in, or, in, in open uh, products, uh, as well as delivering two uh, digital platforms <coughs> into the company. Uh, huge customer base, 300, uh, sorry, 30 companies already uh, in, in the market, and we are consolidating across Europe. <clears throat> um, we're confident of the market. We're confident of this growth space. So we will be offering a dividend in two years, and we have a clearly defined exit strategy. Um, the, the team, so Cahal Friel, again, he sends his apologies for not being here tonight. Um, he's a stockbroker stock by, by trade. He's worked in uh, the London markets, the Dublin markets, um, <clears throat> co-founder of um, Raglan Capital. Uh, he was also co-founder of Merion Stockbrokers in, du in Dublin, which was acquired by Linsbink uh, Lins Bank in 2006 for 80 million. Uh, he's also, and it was mentioned earlier during the AMRIT talk, he was the uh, founder and chairman of Fastnet uh, Oil and Gas. It was an exploration company, but then, and it, raised, it was very successful in its day. It raised 50 million and was doing well. But then, as we all know, uh, the price of oil dropped. Uh, uh, Fastnet kind of shut up, but uh, was a reverse takeover into AMRIT that you heard uh, in the first half of the, of the, the talks tonight. So Cahal is a co-founder of AMRIT together with uh, Joe Wiley that was talked about earlier, uh, and is the largest single independent shareholder in Amrit. Um, he's also uh, worked with Fastnet, as I told him, Ragman Capital. So he's a stockbroker. He's used to doing good companies and good uh, exits. Uh, Brendan Buckley is our chairman. Brendan is a clinician <coughs> by training. He had a, a, an electric uh, data capture company called Firecrest that was acquired by Icon in 2012. He became then the chief medical officer in Icon. Icon is a clinical trial research organization based out of Dublin, about eight billion in, in market cap. Um, it's probably the second, maybe third largest uh, CRO globally. 
Um, <clears throat> he has been on the executive leadership team. He's run sales and marketing, or sorry, mergers and acquisitions, a lot of diligence. So he's very active in the orphan space. He was with the EMA working on their orphan drug strategy um, and also the orphan drug protocols uh, over the, the early 2000s. Uh, and myself, entrepreneur by training, co-founded different companies. Um, <clears throat> most recently in genomics meds in Ireland, a lot of the, the companies I've been involved in have been genomic-driven companies trying to understand the genetics of diseases, both complex and rare. In this particular case, uh, I'm actually focusing that, uh, that expertise on rare diseases. And as you heard also earlier today, uh, most of the rare diseases have a genetic basis, and are fu it's fundamental actually in, in most rare diseases. Um, GMI was acquired by Wish Unexco just last November, um, so, and that was after a series the investment of 400 million into the company. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm not going to go through everything there, but I have worked in the major uh, by, uh, pharma companies. Merck Serono brought help to bring three products to a global market there. Uh, also with Pfizer, uh, again, lots of patents from my activities there. So what you have here is people with expertise in finance, people with expertise in drug development, pharmaceuticals, and people with expertise in orphan products. Uh, a little bit of the highlights, and these are some interim results. A lot of this does reflect the first six months of 2019 when it was then. Um, <clears throat> Open Orphan has two days in that period, so we didn't really have a huge influence in the figures here. But just a little bit of the highlights I want to go through. Um, it was a transformational uh, takeover, and I think that's reflected in the share price. Uh, we're right-sizing Venn. Venn, despite its revenues of 14 million, 14 and a half million, we acquired at a very good price, which I'll get into. Um, <clears throat> we are developing the pipeline of Venn and, and really driving out to the customers. A lot of good customers, a lot of repeat customers, which we're, we're, bolting, uh, we're adding on to. Um, <clears throat> and we're also gonna, gonna do an acquisition strategy to have a, a broad European presence in, in, the, in the orphan space. We're finally, and I'll talk mostly about this, uh, the latter part of my talk, we are developing a, a genomic uh, health data platform, which I'm driving again. It's all around the genetics of rare disease and how we're gonna use that information to really drive new products for rare disease patients. Um, in terms of financial highlights, uh, we raised 4.5 million on the, on the market earlier this year. The, the interim results for Venn have been published, 5.8 million this year, a little lower than expected, but we are guiding around the same as last year. Most, in, most interestingly, though, the cost uh, and maybe the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, we won't be profitable, but we will be getting closer to profitability because of the right size, you know, Venn. Um, a lot of the other things there I'm not going to go into. Um, Really what I want to talk about is why, why are orphan products such a growth uh, part of the market? It is growing at about twice the rate of non-orphan products uh, or non-rare disease products. And last year, for example, um, <clears throat> 50, over 50% 50 of the products approved by the FDA, the regulatory authority in the USA, more than half of them were uh, orphan products. So this, as a result, there's a huge cons uh, consulting market, which we're in, high-end consulting market. This is the size of the market in the US, 9.9 billion. It just has an active CAGR of 8.8. .8. There's a huge amount of products in the pipeline for drug development with the FDA, 2,500. This is our pipeline. And like I said, it's a huge market, even in Europe, 30 million people. Um, <clears throat> the reason why it has developed in the last 20 years is because of the, uh, the legislations that were put in place both in the US and in Europe to really drive and incentivize these companies to do the research into these products. So despite the small size of the, the, the market, the patient market, if you will, um, there's huge incentives. <clears throat> For example, you get market exclusivity, 10 years in Europe, seven in the US. Pricing power, it's been talked about already. These are so, so particularly exquisitely designed products that the pricing you can charge for them is higher, about four and a half times non-orphan products. There is a fast expedited review with the FDA and you get these vouchers which you can trade, <clears throat> which are worth an awful lot. Smaller uh, clinical trials, and again, this is just to expedite the review. Uh, despite all that, it is a growth sector, but in the US, <clears throat> there's about 520 products on the market in the US only 180 on the, on the European market. So this disparity uh, is really our opportunity. What we're trying to do in orphan, uh, Open Orphan most immediately is bring these products, these orphan products that are on the market in the US to Europe. 
you might ask, why are they not in Europe? The main reason why they're not in Europe is because of reimbursement in Europe is very complex. When I talk about reimbursement, I'm talking about who pays for this drug once prescribed for the patient. In the US, it's very straightforward. <clears throat> it's three different agencies. Once you get regulatory approval, the three different agencies, the insurance companies, which take over the, the paying for those products. In Europe, it's complex. In, in the UK, for example, you have three different agencies. You have NICE in the UK, you have the Welsh and the Scottish authorities. In France, there's 14 different agencies. In Italy, there's 45. In Germany, there's 10. It's complex. Uh, it's complicated. Um, so really, what we're saying, these pharma companies in the US that have these products, even some of them, are not, they're not all in the US, but most of them are. They're very focused on the US market. They don't have the bandwidth, and they don't have the expertise to really navigate this complex system. Open Orphan, as a pan-European consulting house, will bring these products to Europe for these companies. The regulation's pretty straightforward. We can use the dossier they use in the, in the US registration in Europe, but we'll negotiate the, the reimbursement in, in all the major markets of Europe, which are uh, Germany, France, UK, Italy, and Spain. So that's, that's the market opportunity. It is a three-pronged business model. The first one I talked about already, correcting Venn. We're in the process of doing that. These are the two digital platforms that are coming on stream. <clears throat> Virtual Rep is really a digital engagement platform. I'll talk less about that because it is coming after the, uh, the genomics health database that we're, we're about to, to launch. So just going back to Venn, it was undercapitalized. It was underutilized staff utilization at about 60%. A lot of property not being utilized. <clears throat> a lot of incorrect staff. Despite all that, it, it was loss making, but despite all that, it had good customers which we want to keep and want to grow. It was undervalued. We acquired it at four million, despite the fact it was uh, had annual revenues in excess of 45, uh, 14 million. We're going to correct that. 80% of the business is repeat, strong customer base. Uh, and in a growth sector. Um, and again, or, uh, orphan, orphan, Open Orphan will actually work in non-orphan space, but the focus is on orphan products. So the goal is recapitalize. I think that's started to happen. We have injected new capital. Um, <clears throat> restructure, we're kind of outsourcing deals to, to get the staff utilization correct. We want to be profit-making through the correction and downsizing of, of staff. Uh, and re-rate so that we are, most people in the sector, they're rated at about two to, two and a half to three times sales. So based on our sales of uh, 40 million last year, we should be valued <coughs> above, above 30 million. And then launch additional services, which I'll talk about now. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this, I've kind of talked about it. <clears throat> but in terms of the virtual rep, this really is a digital engagement platform to allow pharma companies talk to the people who are going to uh, prescribe the drugs in Europe. Um, it's like the Facebook of, of sales and marketing for pharma products. Um, it's going to launch after the, the, uh, the genomics health database. I'm not going to talk about it. I just want you to be aware of it. It's going to be launched in the first half of next year, 2020. This is really what I want to talk about. It is <clears throat> what are we doing with the, uh, the genomic health database platform that we're about to roll out. So really what we want to do, first of all, is to become the leading broker of rare disease data uh, globally. Uh, we have a low-cost model. I'll tell you how we're going to do that. Um, well, actually, let me tell you now because uh, fundamentally, rare disease patients that have been on this odyssey for a long time, they're, they're, they're probably the most clinically analyzed and genomically analyzed patients of any patient data set. Um, the, the data we're looking to corral in our database pre-exists. So we don't have to do the heavy lifting of doing the clinical analysis or the genetic analysis. It's there. So under GDPR, we're asking the, the patients to really share their data with us in our database. It's secure, it's GDPR compliant, it's encrypted, it's pseudo-anonymized. It's not about the individual, it's about the aggregate data. So we're asking them to do this, and we're working with the patient advocacy groups. Again, they were mentioned before. These are the groups that really lobby on behalf of these patients. They're like the charities often. They put resources in place, the, the infrastructure they lobby to governments for better uh, facilities for these patients. So we're asking them also to advocate on our behalf to their patients to really drive the awareness of our database and ask their patients to share their data with us. So once we get that data, we corral it. It's obviously broken down by disease type. Um, it is standardized, uh, and standardized in a way that it is useful to pharma companies. And what I mean useful is that they pretty much look at the genomic uh, information and really try to identify the variations in the genome that cause these diseases. That pinpoints where their drug development uh, research should start. Um, so they will pay for access to that data, and a component of that 
uh, data uh, access fees will be shared back to the advocacy groups who will really have a little bit more uh, funds to, to really support these patients. So again, it is putting the patient a little bit centric in driving this research. So again, under GDPR, patients do have a little bit more power in where they put their data, obviously, but then using that data to drive research into their very specific rare disease. You might ask about the, the monetary value of that. These are just examples of investments into similar type companies. Not all uh, rare disease focused, but just examples of companies. Um, I'll just go back, actually, just to this slide. What, I, what, we, what we're aiming to do in Open Orphan is really acqu acquire about 10,000 different records from the 30 million people in Europe that suffer from rare diseases. That's not a lot. That's less than 1%. It's about one third of 1% of that patient uh, set. And the data exists for that amount of, of patients. And we really we're driving that um, because <clears throat> that's all we need. Because with rare disease, you don't need a huge amount of, of data, but you need good data, but you don't need a huge amount of samples. A hundred samples from a, a patient group with a certain disease compared to uh, patients without that disease is probably enough to identify the genetic variation. You might say why it hasn't been done. It has been done in certain rare diseases, and a lot of it is known, but a lot of them are untapped, uh, and the, the genetic cause is unknown. Examples of some companies that have acquired, that have raised monies, significant monies, uh, for this kind of data ac acquisition companies. And then the next slide is really examples of what pharma companies are prepared to pay to really get access, sometimes exclusively, for this data set. Uh, when I talked about the 10,000, data records we hope to collect or corral in our database. Each one of those per patient is valued roughly, based on these precedents, at about 5,000. So the nominal value of that, uh, of that database is about 50 million. That's just assuming a linear uh, access fee. We hope there will be multiple uh, pharma companies looking at this data at the same time. And I'm not even going to talk about if they find drugs based on the data they look at through this database, there will be milestone payments and ro royalties of any product that comes out of that finding. So there is a huge upside in value here. Um, so I have four minutes. I just want to wrap up and say it's, it's quite complex. It's, it's basic research. It's genetics. There's a huge value in, in DNA. It might have been uh, mitigated a little bit earlier. But really, it is a new management team. It's a new opportunity here. Uh, track record of building really successful companies <clears throat> and, and know how to get in and out of a company. Clear strategy for growth, fast growing market. It, we, we would only operate in a, in a market that is fastly growing. And we will, we're confident that you know, we will be able to give a dividend in two years and we have a very uh, clearly defined exit strategy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. OK, then, do you have any questions for Morris? Any hands? I've got one on the last slide and the first slide you said you had a clear defined exit strategy. Mm -hmm. What's that then? <laughs> <laughs> to be acquired. <laughs> to be acquired. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're building this database and we're, we're driving these products through, you know, regulatory approval, clinical evaluation. Um, once we get to about 50 million, uh, the likes of IQVIA, Icon, Paraxel, who do not have a, a, an orphan pr franchise, will really like this, will like this opportunity. So that's one, one way we're doing it. We have to get above 30 million to be on the radar of those companies, even though we're talking to lots of different companies. We're in the, uh, very active in the acquisition trail and hope to announce an acquisition before the end of the year that is part of bolstering uh, and bolt-ons to uh, the open orphan business model. So you know, getting to that 30 million uh, golden ticket, kind of, if you will. So uh, active, active in the bolt-on acquisition strategy uh, and always talking to the big IQVIAs of this world. Do you think it's ultimately it's a company built to be sold? It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and while generating you know, uh, value for pharma companies as we push their products <coughs> in parallel. And so I appreciate time scales are difficult, but what would you hope? Um, do you think this is a three, five, seven, ten? Well, how many years would you expect? <coughs> Two to, to get three better? years. Two to three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the value, and actually, the, so the, the Venn by itself is valuable, and it was, it was undervalued when we acquired it. Um, but the, uh, the, the data we're generating in the genomic health database is hugely valuable. And on the genomic health database, um, the question that came to my mind, so with GDPR, um, you have access to, to your data. So kind of how, how would the process work whereby I've, I'm a patient, mm -hmm. How, how do you get that data? Do, do you do tests? Do I get it from the hospital? What's the process? Yeah. 
It's that a, data getting into the database? It's a very good question, and it's probably going to be a combination of everything you just said. Uh, so because patients own their data, they can decide where it goes. Sometimes they may not always have their data, though, at hand. So when you sign up to our database, there's actually very fundamental, some clinical questions we go through. Most of that is patient-derived, so it's very easy for the patient to, to really give us that information. Uh, and patients with rare disease are very motivated to, to really understand the disease and also drive for better treatments or, or products. Um, so that's the easy part. In a lot of cases, they've gone through the genetic analysis as well. Even Genome England is doing that as a part of clinical practice now. So whole genome sequences is being done for people with rare diseases. So the, the genetic data exists. In some cases, the patients have the data. They can just give us a link and download it onto a website, so it's as simple as that. If it's with the hospital, they can ask the hospital for that data, get it back to the patient, and then they give it to us, or they can go ask the hospital to give it to us. The second route's probably going to be a little bit more difficult because the hospitals probably will want to only give it back to the patient, so it might be a two-step process. But legally, uh, the, the hospitals and the clinics have to do that now under GDPR. So you'd expect the, 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 the health service or equivalent uh, organization to be doing the testing. You're not going to be doing the testing. No, we're not doing yeah. the testing. That's, that's the whole concept here. With rare disease, all the data pre-exists, so we don't have to do it. We just have to find a way to get it into our database. Okay. Any other questions, please? Oh, there's a couple here now. Bear with me a moment. I've got a microphone here. You can uh, have the first one. You showed a slide with uh, quite a lot of competitors. Is there yes. a possibility that the space might be overfilled? Um, I think everyone's beginning to realize the value of data and people's data. Um, most of those companies I showed, they're not in the uh, rare disease space. They are data brokers, if you will, uh, personal uh, data brokers across all disease types. So we're quite unique in that. And the fact we have the, the clinical evaluation, the consulting activity, kind of sets us apart from all those. We're very focused on the rare disease space. Uh -huh. uh, other questions? Do you have a question there? Yeah. I'd just like to have understood um, why you can't go to the UK Biobank to get your data. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, a lot of that data is public and we can access it. Uh, the 100,000 genomes, uh, the uh, kind of project, there's a lot of other rare disease patient public databases that we can go to. A little bit of the issue there, the, the clinical information isn't great, uh, the phenotypic information, if you will, it's not great. But we can corral some of that data into a format that is accessible to pharma companies. And we're not ruling that out because that is useful data in terms of numbers, in terms of corralling it. The way it's formatted in most of the public databases, it's hard to interpret, it's hard to do the analysis. We can take it, we can download it, and make it more uh, analyzable, if you will. So it's a combination of doing that together with the patient, uh, the 30 million people from Europe. Uh, gentleman here. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested by that database. Um, and especially the 50 million, did you say, it could be worth. Yeah. Um, when do you th expect to see revenues from that database? Uh, so we are, we're, we, it hasn't been rolled out yet. We're in the middle of beta testing the database, uh, and we're, we're signing up early adopters of pharma companies who want to look and play with the database and also impact its functionality and design to some extent. We're also talking to early adopters within the patient advocacy groups. Um, we don't have any formally signed up yet, but we are talking to a lot. There's a lot of interest. Um, to answer your question, we go live uh, either later this year or into the first quarter of next year, depending on the, the gist of development. And again, it is the highest level of encryption. It's all pseudonymized. We have to go through that. We have to make sure we have all our DPIAs for the GDPR all in place. So there are a few things we still have to go through. Um, I imagine we will have pharma companies on board in 2020. I, I'm not going to say when in there, but I, I imagine we will and be making revenue from that. Any other questions, please? I had one uh, final question then. The, uh, the company that you acquired to start this, Venn uh, Life Sciences, can you talk a bit about what they do as a business Yeah. Um, and the customers they've already got? Yeah. They are a clinical trials company, a CRO, 
and consulting has. So they do clinical trials recruitment uh, for pharma companies, so they were always a pharma service company. They also did uh, consulting work, so they would design a trial for companies. That's a large part of how you design it, what are the endpoints, the, the parameters to mark success of a trial, how do you do the statistics. So there's a lot of thinking that goes into trial before you actually start. They do that, and they do the uh, filing of, the, of all the data, the dossier, into the EMA and the FDA, and, and then also the reimbursement. So Venn did a lot of that. In fact, of their 40 million, 6 million was consulting consulting, the rest was uh, clinical trials. Okay. <coughs> that, sorry, Karen. Uh, yeah, and, and they're, they're in, they're in um, Paris or in Amsterdam, the small Dublin office, uh, which we have now acquired. So we, we are consolidating a lot of the activities, but the expertise within Venn is very good and was very good. It was just mismanaged. Any kind of customers they've got? Yeah, sorry, that was the second part of your question. Yeah, Farming, Boringer Ingelheim, Prometeor, um, Servier, Galapagos, you know, a lot of the high-end companies are there, a lot of the companies with orphan products. Okay. Um, I think that's it then, Morris. Thank you very much indeed. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And our final presenter this